Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Newspapers have been put to good use. Who's responsible for this? I hear it's all of you. Hmm? Well done. Usually I'm, I'm against people wasting their lives reading newspapers. I see very little good that can come to people by reading newspapers. Because much of it, not all of it, much of it is just trash. It just feeds people's curiosity, but it doesn't really help people advance themselves spiritually or in any other way. This is only my personal opinion. I, there may be others who think and feel differently. I used to uh, do a lot of speaking on positive thinking and giving value to people, people's lives and I was not very keen on people reading newspapers because I've done it myself plenty of times. Every morning on the tube to work, I used to pick up the, uh, the metro. And then on the way back, <clears throat> they had what they call the independent, I think. I can't remember now exactly. But there were these free newspapers and you would read it from, I would read it from cover to cover and at the end of the one and a half hours or however long the commute was, nothing had changed. <laughs> I was just the same person. My head was full of some rubbish. Because a lot of the time, you know, it is what people like that drives news. That's why a lot of the time you, when you read a newspaper, you don't get to hear about all the good things that are going on out there. Do you? Most of the time it's what? Things that are really bad and terrible about this world. And at the end of that, you just felt, you, you just left feeling unhappy and disgruntled, disappointed with the human kind, the human race, and you begin to wonder, is it all worth it? It's not really a booster of confidence or a booster of energy and excitement within you, but rather it's a downer, from my personal opinion. But to see today that newspapers has been, have been good, put to good use as an offering to the Dhamma, to the Buddha, is truly something, it's remarkable. So whoever's gotten involved, all of you, in the time that you've taken to put it together, as well as I saw the, the thing outside, the instructions on how you've very carefully thought about how you can transform a simple act of making a paper flower into something that can be an exercise for you to practice the Dhamma is marvelous, truly. Did you all see the board outside on your way in? the careful instructions on how piece by piece, fold by fold, it becomes a flower. But there is no flower, it's just the folds of the paper that eventually manifest itself into a flower. See, this is what is important, ladies and gentlemen. In your day-to-day -day activities, you know, just going about doing your usual stuff, you need to find the opportunities to practice the Dhamma. Because otherwise, no one's going to come and give you other chances to practice the Dhamma. You need to find them. You don't need to do anything special or anything spectacular for that. All those opportunities are with you. And we'll talk about how you can do some of that in today's talk as well. Right, let's begin then. 
So before we begin, let us all take a moment to bring our palms together in veneration of the supremely enlightened one, the fully awakened one. He who is our guide, our master, our teacher, the undefeated one, the unvanquished one, the infinitely compassionate one, the Supreme Buddha. As we bring our palms together in veneration of his holy name, let us also remind ourselves that here, under this one roof, together, we take a pledge of allegiance. Allegiance to the noble path, allegiance to Nibbana, allegiance to our practice, so that we ourselves can tread the same path that our forefathers, the Buddha himself, tread and experience the ultimate bliss that is the promise for all human beings seeking freedom from suffering. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa You must know by now that I am a big believer in making full use of human potential. I see in front of me human potential. Lots of it. Lots and lots of it. Humanness is an opportunity. Do you see it that way? Do you see that humanness is an opportunity? It is what you have. It is a chance to make a change. It is a chance to make an impact. It is a chance to experience something you haven't before. It is a chance to do something worthwhile, ladies and gentlemen. It is a chance to make some choices and some decisions where you have no regrets at the end. That is what you've been waiting for, to be born human. So you can make use of that opportunity. So you can use that chance. So you can go beyond the thinking that you have always been. So you can make a change. So you don't have to settle with suffering. Oh, but how I wish and pray that people really understood the true value of being human. Very seldom do I see that. Many people are born human. Of course, people are born human. But not many of them do the things that humans need to do. Precious human life is wasted. It's wasted not only on the battlefield, as you might think on first count, but it's also wasted in front of a television. Which one is worse? On the battlefield, you only die once. You tell me which one's worse then. You might wonder why does Swami Nuhansi feel so passionately about you know, wasting time on newspapers? Is it so bad that we get to know a little bit about what's going on out there? Should we not keep abreast with what's going on, the advancements that the world is making? Or should we just isolate ourselves into a little corner somewhere and just be ignorant of all that is going on out there? Well, I ask this question from you folks. How much has you, or how much has your getting to know of all that is going on out there, not just in this planet, but in planets outside, really helped you on your quest to free yourself from suffering? Take account of how many newspapers you've read by now in your life. 
You've read more newspapers than your weight. Yeah? How much has that really helped you free yourself from suffering? It takes one to know one, so I know exactly where you're coming from. I was a fan of the same habit, but I broke that habit. I broke that habit well before I started listening to the Dhamma. I broke that habit when I got to listen to a mentor who started teaching me about personal effectiveness. About making use of human life. Making use of it effectively. Every other newspaper you read is going to leave you deflated. Don't take my word for it. Buy one on your way home. Have a read of it. Have a scorecard alongside. So read the newspaper, have a scorecard alongside. Every article you come across, make a mark on it. Positive and negative. Remember, you are your environment. You are the product of your environment. We spoke about this last week. If you are a positive person, that's because you associate with positive people. Show me the five people you spend most of your time with and I'll tell you who you are. You don't need to tell, come and introduce yourself to me. In fact, you can just send the five people you spend most of your time with to me. I'll speak with them and I'll tell you who you are. This is not magic. It's not some special power that I possess. It is just the way it works, cause and effect. You are the effect of the causes that you are surrounded by. Don't you agree? You are heavily influenced by your environment. So much so that you are nothing more than it. Yes, of course, there is nurture and nature. And often a topic that gets debated a lot. Which one's more powerful? Nurture or nature? Nature is what you were born as. Nurture is the environment that you come in. In fact, in Buddhist philosophy, we talk of this as the environment and the vipaka. The two things that together result in you. The environment and the vipaka. Let me give you a simple example. What do you do when you cross the street? Or just before? You look left or you look right, left, right again, and you cross the street, right? Do you have to do that before you cross the street? Or cross the road? You don't have to. You can cross the road blindfolded. But what are the chances of you actually getting to the other side in one piece? Especially if you are stood on a highway or a motorway or maybe on a road that has heavy traffic, chances are very slim. So then now we have to figure out, are there vipakas? So I use the word vipaka because I think you're all very familiar with the term vipaka. I can use the word results, but it doesn't have the same ring to it. Karma and vipaka, you know, these are words that mean something to us. You're all comfortable with me using the word karma and vipaka? Good. So karma is the deeds and vipaka are the results. Because people often ask this question. Is Buddhism deterministic? Is there nothing we can do? Do we just wait to see what happens to us? A question that might have crossed your mind from time to time as well. If all is karma and vipaka, if the karmas have been done in the past, then do we just sit on our backsides waiting for something to happen? Can we not have any influence or any impact or any choice about what's going to happen next? Because last week I talked to you about free will and I said, get that heck, get that thing out of your mind. So the thinkers among you would have inevitably come up with this question, well, if there's no such thing as free will, Swami Nansa, then are we just, you know, to sit here like a potato waiting for something to happen to us and, you know, with no, uh, nothing we can do about it. These two things we must learn, understand, because these two things are what will decide the future of your lives, ladies and gentlemen. Vipaka and the environment. They both contribute. So it's not just Vipaka. When you cross the road, 
you check either side. You look either side because you want to create the environment which attracts the right kind of vipaka. Believe you me, there are two types of vipaka. One that will help you cross the road unscathed, but there's another that will get you run over. They are both waiting to happen. There are plenty of times where you've helped an old lady cross the road and those vipakas are all there as well as the times where you'd have run over someone, perhaps even deliberately. And those karmas have also generated vipakas, they're also waiting to happen. But which one comes forward now? It's not predetermined, it's not. Cause and effect. Create the right causes, you'll get the effect. That is why our humanness is such a powerful thing. See, we can take on views, we can take on drushti, we can take on new knowledge. Our minds are capable of taking on views about this world, about karma, about vipaka, about the dhamma, about good and bad, about associating the right kind of people, the wrong kind of people, about habits, about behaviors, about positive things and negative things. Our minds can learn, we can assimilate knowledge. Therefore, we can determine what sort of vipakas we attract. That is why I speak to you. Because you are all capable of determining which vipakas you attract towards yourself. If you are hungry, there are two things you can do right now. What are those two things? You can either eat or you can starve. If you choose to starve, this sensation of hunger will continue. But if you eat, then that hunger will be sated. You can choose to eat, you can choose not to eat. If you are thirsty, you can choose to drink, take a drink of water, a sip of water, or you can choose not to. If you are standing up and your legs begin to hurt, you can choose two things. You can either sit down or choose to keep on standing. Then you'll ask the question again, so we can choose, so we have free will. It's a fine line. I'm going to try and explain to you the difference between these two things. Otherwise people get into this thinking that it's all predetermined, so what's the point of us coming here at all anyway? If we can't decide what's going to happen next, if we can't decide our fate, if we are going to go to hell, then we are going to go to hell, so how can we change it? What's the point of us even trying? If I'm going to be attaining Nibbana in, in three million births time, then why do I even bother now? Questions that you will have. The Buddha's philosophy is not one of determinism. The Buddha's philosophy is Hetu Palavada or cause and effect. Create the right causes and the, right, and the effect will manifest. We as human beings, ladies and gentlemen, we have intelligence. We can think about the causes that we want to line up. You know, that is how we advance as human beings and that is why animals are always animals. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't create things, they don't innovate things, do they? They're just creatures of habit. They don't create things because they can't take on new views about the world. They can't explore, they, don't, they can't study, they can't learn things. But that is the state we were once in. Today, thankfully to our merits, we have been born human in the Sugati world. This word Sugati, you'll have heard this, Sugati and Dugati. They are two Sinhalese terms, but they are borrowed from the Pali. And it refers to the blissful plane and the woeful plane. So you know that the woeful plane entails the four great hells and the blissful plane begins with the human, the human world and goes up all the way to the formless sphere. If you've done any reading or listening to any 
talks that talks about the 31 worlds of existence, you may have come across this. But my point is not about how many worlds there are and you know, for us to go and explore them and study them. My point that I wish to make here is, we are all in the Sugati. It's important to ask ourselves the question, why do we call it the Sugati? That's why I don't like the English translation, blissful plane. The word Sugati means you are able to cleanse your temperament. You are able to cleanse yourself. You are able to cleanse your defilements. You are able to take on views and therefore rechart your path from here on. All human beings are born with this ability, especially those who can think. Of course, there are from time to time human beings who are born but, you know, for various karmas that they've done in the past, they don't have the intellectual ability. They can't think for themselves. From time to time we see this in society. They're born with various syndromes. I don't need to spell it out to you, I think you know this. So they'll forever have to live needing support from someone else who will be there to guide them, to hold their hand, even at the age of 80. They will still need someone to help them, walk them, guide them, feed them, wash them, and so on. So although they have taken human form, physically, their minds are just short of full human capacity. But we are different. You're all different. You all have the full capacity to think. See, you have chosen to be here today, this morning. As you're here today, you get to hear these words. These are all Vipakas. If you were at home today, you would still have heard something, but maybe not these words. You may have watched the news, watched a teledrama, or gone to the park, done something, but not this Vipaka. Because your mind can take on Drushti, your mind is able to attract, you know, like attracts like. You are able to create a magnet within yourself, a magnet that attracts particular types of vipaka towards you. Now, what does becoming a sotapanna entail? You all know this fact that once you become a sotapanna, you are no longer, you can no longer be born in the four great hells. You are free from them once and for all, right? So you got to think, why so? How is that possible? It is not the body that becomes a Sotapan, it's the mind that becomes a Sotapan. So once you have become a Sotapan or a stream enterer, how is it that from there on, there is no potency for one to be born in the four great hells? That is because by using your human capacity to change your drushti, the mind is now purified, the mind is now cleansed from a certain number of defilements which would otherwise have attracted towards it the vipakas that would have brought you rebirth in the four great hells. But you have now been able to free yourself from that once you've become a sotapanna. See, if you take a walk down memory lane, just think about the way you live your life, ladies and gentlemen, you know, you know this as a fact. You decided to come here long, come along here today. You decided to dress the way you are today. These are all based on drushti. Yesterday's or not yesterday's, last week's talk was to try and explain to you that this drushti that you take on are the driving force behind your actions. It's not that you, are, you act just out of no reason. It's not like you act without rhyme or reason. In fact, there is no such thing called random. We don't make random choices. All our choices are based in some logic. So you can consider them, say, pseudo-random. It's not really random. Although things you do seem random, like, you know, once you just wake up one morning and you think, today I want to go and see my folks. I want to go see my grandmother. And then the rest of the day works out, plans out in that way. And you wonder, why did I think about that? You may not know exactly why the thought came into your mind, but there was a reason for that. Perhaps last night you saw her in your dreams. 
or perhaps last night someone mentioned something about mother or grandmother or maybe someone just mentioned the word grand canyon you may not always know what those causes are and you don't always need to the understanding of anicca entails your understanding of the fact that all things are driven by cause and effect you don't necessarily need to know all those causes to live a comfortable life we use science and what science does it it goes on to find out what those causes are for instance when you want a fire we use science to find out what the causes are that bring up a fire and what extinguishes the fire we know the causes thanks to science how this microphone works we know how breathing works we know how digestion works we know how growing up works we know how the lights work we know how the stars work we know how air the wind works because science has given us answers to these questions but science is yet to give you an answer to why you suffer what is the science that deals with the with suffering now of course you know science that teach, that deals with living things is called what ology biology science that te- that deals with the earth is called geography science that deals with the with society is called sociology what is the science that deals with suffering you know the science that deals with the mind it's called psychology but what is the science that deals with suffering and freedom from suffering and happiness what is that science you have no answer because it is not a science that they teach you at school or at university because they are yet to discover that scientists have figured out how human behavior works what they haven't figured out is how the human mind works what is it in the mind that makes you human these are the questions that science have not yet discovered but that science was discovered 2 and 1/2 thousand years ago you are so blessed don't undermine yourself at any point you are so fortunate to at least call yourselves nominally as buddhists remember buddhism is not a religion although people might claim it to be we are here to talk about buddhist philosophy this is the science of the mind the science of how suffering works the four noble truths this is the real science that we need to free ourselves from suffering once and for all so the reason i am against things like reading newspapers watching the news wasting your time in front of a television set is because you're wasting human precious human life ladies and gentlemen that is the only problem i have with it nothing more should they not make their money of course they must newspaper publishers they must make their money but at whose expense is what i ask you if you are okay with that i'm okay with that remember whenever something's free you are the product being sold the metro is a free newspaper it took me a while to figure that out i thought how kind of them mainstream tv is free you know there are subscription t- you can buy subscription tv but mainstream tv you know how many channels do you have these days on tv how many 300 and what started off as one tv channel many years ago perhaps when you were in your youthful years is now you know many dozens right you are spoiled for choice by now there aren't enough buttons on the remote control to program all your tv channels <laughs> am i right of course how many radio channels are there those days you had to tune the old uh, radio so I, i remember my grandfather i used to tune the the old thing and he used to spend several minutes or at least you know 10 good 10 15 minutes trying to catch a radio station these days you can you know do it blindfolded just switch the damn thing on and just give it a twist it will end on some fm 
so much choice. But the thing is, it's all free. Oh, isn't that good, eh? It's all free. But little do we stop to think, if something's free, then how do they make their money? Once again, I have nothing against those who wish to make money. Because money needs to be made. Of course, that's what money is for. It has to be made and it has to be spent. It is what keeps the economy going. If we had no capitalists, right, then the world wouldn't exist. If we had no socialists, the world wouldn't exist. If we had no liberal democrats, the world wouldn't exist. If we had no left-wing and right-wing, the world wouldn't exist. You always need representation from all parts of society for a world to exist. That's the way the world works. You need the Lib Dems and you need the Conservatives. It's the way the world works. You need good and bad in, in this world, otherwise the world wouldn't exist. The reason that today you can give someone an award and say you're a good man is because there are bad people in this world. So in contrast, you stand out. If everyone was good, if everyone was Mahatma, do you think today we'd be talking about Mahatma Gandhi? Of course not. The reason the good shine is because there are bad. There are the bad out there. So for this world to exist, you exist, you need both, good and bad. You need the left and right. But I'm talking to you, ladies and gentlemen, about a philosophy that does not entail existence in this world. It is not a temporal science. I'm talking about something that goes beyond, it transcends what we understand as this living world that we are in. It goes beyond sight and sound and smell and taste and touch. It goes beyond what we understand as this sensual world. That is what I'm talking to you about. I'm talking to you about an understanding that elevates you while you are physically in this world you are able to free yourself from the turmoil and the suffering that all people in this world have to endure and all that is required is for you to come to that realization so as harsh as my comments might have been to begin with and I wonder whether I was too harsh or too critical I've got nothing against newspapers, but what I have is I have something against you spending precious human life with a newspaper in your hand. I've got nothing against newspapers. I've got a problem with you spending your precious human life in front of a TV set. <clears throat> How many hours of TV have you watched by now? <clears throat> Tell me what impact it has it had on your life? <clears throat> Excuse me. Has it made you happier? How many dramas have you been to and watched? How many films have you watched? Far too many to remember, far too many to count. Are you happier? Do you feel your life is fulfilled? Do you feel your life is satisfied now? Have you stopped getting angry then because you've watched all these films? Have you stopped getting disappointed and frustrated? Do you not get annoyed anymore? Do you not feel disappointed anymore? Because you have watched all these films. That's what I'm saying, you know. Be among them. Don't be one of them. I don't have to be among them either. That is because I've made a choice, this choice. But for you all, you're going to have to be among them. Be among the zombies. Pretend to be one. But don't go after blood. But when you see, see a zombie, pretend to be one. Because if you don't pretend to be one, then they will soon, after, soon enough make you one. They'll be at your neck, I tell you. Because, you know, after a sermon, usually people come up to me and talk to me and they say, Swami Nasa, life is getting difficult now. I'm beginning to hear these stories from you now. So I'm life is getting difficult now. I say, why sir? Why madam? 
Well, those days I used to get along with my friends, my family and you know things used to be fine. We used to go on parties, trips and do all sorts of useless things that now I realize is useless but those things you know those were, they were the things I did for my kicks but now I begin to understand. But now I begin to lose interest in them because I realize happiness is not in the sights. Happiness is not in sound or smell or taste or touch. So I mean, I begin to realize that happiness is, is all within my own mind. So I have stopped pursuing happiness by indulging myself in sensuality. But then the people I spend my life with, the people I spend my time with, they expect me to be the same person I used to be. I'm losing interest in these things. What am I supposed to do? I said, you can do one of two things, sir. Either stop listening to the Dhamma. Because right now you're on a fence. Stop listening to the Dhamma and all will be fine. Because what's going to happen when you stop listening to the Dhamma? you get plugged back into the matrix. Life wasn't so difficult before you started listening to the Dhamma, was it? You didn't feel that it was, it was weird to go to a party. You didn't feel that it was weird. But now perhaps you're listening to the Dhamma, you're beginning to understand how the mind works and how the mind in its desperation seeks pleasure from physical movement. How is it that this makes someone happy? <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, the other day I went to the washroom to brush my teeth, right? You know, there are these little insects, I don't know if you've seen them, and I don't know what they call them, I'm still trying to find the, the name. Like, they're little, like little mosquitoes, but they're bigger than that, about 10 times the size of a mosquito. Anyone know the name? They're called what, madam? A uh, crayfly, C R A Y, C R A N E, a crane fly. Thank you. A crane fly. You know what those things do? They come and pitch themselves somewhere on a surface, and then, like, for the rest of its life, for as long it's there, it's there all until a gecko comes and feeds on it. That's what they do. So I was, I was watching this, 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 this insect doing this. And then I thought to myself, what is the difference between this and a dance? You just need a little bit of music. In my old days, I used to beatbox. I'm not, no, I'm not gonna do it now. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Cut it out. I'm a monk now. So in my olden days, in my lay time, right, if I had seen that, I would have probably done a bit of a beatbox. And that would have been a dance. So I then began to wonder, what do people do? You know, people dance. Do you know how silly you look when you dance? No offense. If you've been coming along for a few weeks now, you know that none of this is said to offend you. Yes, it's all done with compassion. But I need you to take a moment to think about how you spend your precious human life, ladies and gentlemen. That is my ask of you. You know, doing this makes you happy. Why? Doing this makes you happy. Why? What is it about this that makes you happy? Dancing only makes you happy because you think you're dancing, not otherwise. If I asked you to do this for the next hour, just do that for the next hour, would you be happy? You just come up here and just keep doing this for, for the next hour. You say, Swaminathan, so I'll look like a fool. But if everyone else is doing it and you have some music, 
Now, you think you're dancing. When you think you're dancing, now it's, it's okay, it's fun. You know, next time you see someone dancing, like especially if you're on, you know, maybe watching a, a video of someone dancing, turn off the music and then watch it. <laughs> just, just do it as an experiment, okay? When you get back home tonight, go on YouTube and like put some, you know, like a crazy dance moves or something, just punch it in on YouTube, switch off the music and just watch people and see what they do. then you will begin to realize what I'm talking to you about. But with the music and the moves, the two of them together, in your mind, you create this, this picture that people are dancing. And when you think that one is someone is dancing, now it becomes okay. Otherwise, you know, honestly folks, you know, tell me how come this can make you happy? Tell me, why does this make you happy? You see someone doing this. <laughs> so if someone's sad, right? You see a bunch of sad people. Put that away, you're sad. Come, do this. Someone's grieving. Huh? They've lost someone, someone close in the family. You go to a funeral. That like people are crying all over the place, right? You say, hello, everyone, 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 hello, right, right, stop, right, just do what I'm doing and you'll all be fine. <laughs> See, now you laugh. Now you laugh. But when you're invited to the dance floor, huh? <laughs> then you should look at yourself. All those swanky dance moves that you have. Next time you have to dance, dance, okay? Don't not dance. Like I said, if you are, be among them. Be among them and do what they do. Next time you dance, be cognizant of the fact that you're actually dancing. Just be mindfully aware of the fact that you're just moving your legs, your limbs, your arms to a rhythm and then question yourself, what am I actually doing here? How does this make me happy? I mean, if you are doing it for exercise, I get it. That exercise is fine, because of course, you know, you need to move your arms, your legs, your body, right? You need a bit of exercise. <clears throat> you need to burn the calories, that's fine. But if you're dancing for dancing's sake, how does that make sense? So, you know, when you get home today, after you watch that video, take yourself in front of a mirror. Ask everyone else to leave, in case you find it too embarrassing. Stand yourself in front of the mirror and just, you know, do your best dance move. And then, you know, just bring yourself to mindful awareness and ask yourself, what are you really doing? As you swing your arms and you swing your legs, as you swing your neck here and there, you you know you, you do your head like this in and out, in and out, up and down, right? Ask yourself, what am I? Why do I think this is fun? You know, we humans, we need to think more and more than this. We can't just be doing what someone else does. Otherwise, it's a disgrace to humanness. You know, we can't just be following orders. We we have to be thinking about what we do. Don't just follow suit. Take a moment to think about, is this what I really want to do with my life? I mean, you see a crazy man, right? So a crazy man, uh, he's walking on the, on the, along the road and you know, he's, he's swinging his head like this. And you tell him he's crazy. Yeah? But I play some music now. And you go like this. That's not crazy. So why is that crazy and you not crazy? Because you think you're rocking to the rhythm. But that man, he's crazy. He's just, you know, swinging his head. And you think that's crazy. Likewise, ladies and gentlemen, you know, what I ask you to do is just take a moment to think about the things that you do in your life to make yourselves happy. And really ask yourselves, have they been meaningful? Have they really gotten you what you wanted? 
If not, change today. That is what being human is all about. Because this is one chance we've got. Once this chance is over, not again for a long time. Take sport, another example. Right? People play football. Just break it down piece by piece and then analyze what football is. You, you know, it only becomes enjoyable because you think they're playing football. Otherwise, what are they really doing? There's a ball and you kick a ball. Once you break it down into its constituent parts, how is football fun? How is it enjoyable? If you do it as exercise, yes, perfectly fine. You need physical activity, yes, perfectly fine. But if you do it for fun, how does that make sense? I'm not asking you to stop playing your sports and games, right? You carry on doing that, but so you, you got to be among them. Be among them, but have a different perspective. Nibban is all to do with the way you think. Remember, I always say, don't become a monk first. Adopt a monk's attitude first. If you become a monk without the monk's attitude, then you don't feel like you fit in this robe. Then you feel out of place. You feel like a fish out of water. And then you want to go back to your lay life because your attitude is a lay attitude. So there's no need to rush into monkhood. But it's important to adapt that, adopt that attitude. So you see someone you know, running around a, uh, a pitch, kicking a ball. And you call that football. But why does someone kick a ball and how do they get joy out of it? Take a moment to think about this. I throw a ball at you, you have a bat in your hand, you hit it and you get joy out of that. How so? How is it fun? Physical exercise and activity? Again, I get it. You get to swing your arms and legs, you know, you get to get some motion going in your body, right? stretch your muscles. Yes, I get all that. But how do you get fun out of playing cricket? How is it fun? But we you know, we've all enjoyed this, this as a game. We've all, you know, from our, that's, you know, this is what we all learned playing. We grew up playing cricket. All of us, most of us at least. But how do we get fun out of playing cricket? How do we get fun out of playing football? By kicking a ball, you get fun out of it. So if I gave you a ball right now, just and say, just keep kicking it, would that be fun? It wouldn't be. So you see, it only becomes fun when you think you're playing the game. So it's all in the mind, is it not? It's all in the mind. My ask is that you, you take an analytical view at everything you do in life. Because after all, ladies and gentlemen, you are the ones who are accountable for what is left at the end of your life. People can come into your life, you know, they can either rejoice in what you have done, they can give you a pat on the back and say, well done, Machan. Or they can go, I'm really sorry to see you in that state. But after all, you know, that is all they can give you, sympathy. If you mess up in life, all you're going to get from somebody else is what? Sympathy. They can't do much more than that. All they have to give you is a word of sympathy, but you have lost an entire lifetime. For the last 20, 30, 40, 50 or 60, 70, 80, however many years you've been alive on this planet, ask yourself, what have you been doing? Just ask yourself, what are the things you've been doing? If you were to categorize them, what are the different categories you can slot them all in? Basically, you can come up with two categories. All of the things that we've been doing in your life, you can slot into two categories. But for the time being, I want you to leave out your practice of Buddhism and you know, looking for something uh, higher, you know, uh, 
great, you know, something higher in your life, something bigger, something better, you know, something, some spiritual advancement, put that all to a side for a second and consider all the, the rest of it. You can put it into two categories. One, for physical comfort. Things that you have been doing for physical comfort. So that in, includes eating. It includes washing yourself. It includes building a house for yourself, right? It includes going for it, taking some, having some exercise. Things that you do for physical comfort. When you're ill, you go to the doctor. Things you do for physical comfort. And then there's another part. The things that you do for your mental pleasure. Now take eating for instance. You do eating, or you eat rather, for both these things. One, for physical comfort. And two, to give yourself mental pleasure. Do you not agree with me? What did you have for dinner last night? Then you'll see what I mean. Your dinner last night was not determined purely out of necessity for your body. It was also determined by what you liked to eat. Your liking to eat has nothing to do with what your body needs. That you do to satisfy your tongue. In fact, it's not the tongue you're trying to satisfy, the mind. Why is it that today, some people, they are overweight, obese. There are of course some cases where people are, it is medically, you know, sometimes it's genetic and there's nothing they can do about that. Right? Sometimes people are born with the, with the genes that determine how their bodies turn out to be. But otherwise, you know, you know in, like in the, in the States, right? fast food, overeating has become such a big problem. It's become almost a pandemic. This is because people have no control over what they eat. And when they have no control over what they eat, like I used to be, as I say, it takes one to know one. I used to be like that. But uh, you know, I, 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 got the, I got the call and at the right time, when went for a checkup and I realized cholesterol levels were shooting off the roof. Right? And soon, if I hadn't followed the doctor's advice, probably I would not be here today. <laughs> At least not in this way. But when the mind does not understand the body, although you know, we spend a lot of time trying to understand everything else in the world, you know, man knows how to send a rocket to the moon, but man doesn't understand how the body works. He doesn't know what is right or wrong for him. He doesn't know what is right for his body, but he understands the ins and outs of a rocket and how to send it to the moon. You know, somewhere down the line, folks, we've messed up. As human beings, we've messed up. And if we've messed up, then we need to correct ourselves. We need to fix ourselves. We need to fix ourselves by beginning to understand what is the mind, how it works, why the mind vexes, why the mind goes into suffering, and what we can do about it, so that we can free ourselves from these vexations. Today, you may have little control about the thoughts that you have. When you grieve over something, you can't stop yourself, can you? Who's the next funeral in your family? Oh, what a question to be asking on a Sunday morning, Swami. How could you? Just think about, you know, naturally, right? We're not talking about like sudden deaths or anything, right? If you just line up the people that you had at home by their age, right? Let's just say, this is not a surprise to you that people die, right? <laughs> we all die, yes? In case you didn't know, well, <laughs> sorry to burst your bubble. We all die. Perhaps I'm the first one to go out of all of us. But let's just assume a natural death for, for, for the time being. If it's a natural death that we are all lined up to, then think about the one who is eldest in your family. You know that funeral is coming soon enough, right? That death is coming. Have you prepared yourself for that, I ask you? Are you ready? It might be your mother, could be your father, could be your brother, are you ready? 
Are you so ready that on the day it happens, you don't shed any tears? It's easy to give me a nod. Most people do. And I appreciate if you can. You know, that is what we are here for. But I really want you to be ready on that day. School doesn't prepare us for that. It doesn't. Your bank manager doesn't prepare you for that. Science doesn't prepare you for that. It'll tell you that you'll die, but it doesn't tell you how to be unfaced by death. It doesn't teach you how to remain unbothered by death. It doesn't teach you that. So you know that someone in your family is going to kick their last bucket soon enough, right? Now, you know, in each of your minds, you will ha you'll be thinking of someone. Of course. Even in my family, someone will go. Now, I have two families, my old family and my new family. I, so far, in my new family, no one's gone yet, but we are waiting for that day. Oftentimes, we talk about it. Who's the first to go? <laughs> Because right, you know, uh, the average age is around 25, 30 at the monastery. The average age. Although we have about 300 residents at the monastery by now, the average age is around 25, 30, that sort of area. But in and amongst them, we have some monks who are in their 50s, others in their 60s. One nearly 70. So he asked this monk, Sir, are you going to go anytime soon? <laughs> You're probably wondering, how could they? With a smile on his face, he says, Oh, yes. With a smile on his face. That's what we need. You know, we need to redefine death. I'm going to help you do that. Your understanding of death is completely flawed. You only cry in the face of death because you don't understand death. Honestly. I'll help you understand what death really means. Death is merely a fiction. It doesn't really happen. Huh? <laughs> yes. Death is not real. It's make-believe. That is why Arahants don't cry. Because they have no notion of death. They are deathless. Now when I say these words, you're probably thinking, of course, an Arahant dies and then they're not born again, so they're not deathless. That's not what I'm talking about. Death is a figment of your imagination. It only happens when jati happens in the mind. Jati is the end product of paticca samuppada. You heard this, have you not? Avidya paccha sankara, paccha vinyana, paccha nama rupa, paccha salayatana, paccha passa, paccha vedana, paccha tanha, paccha upadana. Yes, paccha bhava, paccha jati. What comes then? Jati paccha, jara, marana, soka, Parideva, Dukkha, Domanasa, Upayasa, Evametasa, Kevalasa, Dukkha, Khandasa, Samudeo, Hoti. Now, hear me out. What if, just what if, Jati is purely a condition of the mind? It's like you catching a cold. If jati is a creation of the mind, now what is jara and marana? They are also creations of the mind, aren't they? I'm going to help you understand that all things in this world, ladies and gentlemen, are conditioned manifestations. Nothing was born to die. That's why oftentimes you'll, have, you'll catch me telling you there is nothing to let go. You just need to realize. You know, when I tell you that you know, there's someone in your family who's, who's lined up next 
for this, you're probably thinking, gosh, how am I going to let go of them before the inevitable happens to them? I love my mother, I dote on my mother. I, I love my mother to bits. Now when my mother goes, I'm going to be in pieces. So how do I let go of my mother before that happens? Is the question that you have to ask. You love your children. So how do I let, last week we spoke about this, if you can't, if you don't learn, if you don't realize who your children really are, one of these days something's going to happen to them and you're going to go crazy. I meant to bring the video to show you but I couldn't, I couldn't find it. I'll bring it to you next week. The video of the mother and her two children who were struck by lightning. I'll give you a disclaimer before I show the video because it will not be for the faint hearted. What do I mean by faint-hearted? <laughs> People who think that death is real. That is what the faint-hearted is. Once you understand that death is actually just a creation of the mind, it's a story the mind tells itself. There's a birth, there's growing up, there's decay and there's death. That's the story. And then once you, are, once you die, you're born again. And the story continues. See, that's a nice story that we like to tell us. It's a tale. It's a tall tale. Once you realize that all there are, are manifestations, ladies and gentlemen, you will realize that there is nothing born to die. But today, what we've, we've done ourselves a huge disservice by interpreting jati, which is the word that the Buddha used to talk about a condition that happens to the mind as birth, as human beings. We've done ourselves a huge disservice by doing that. So today most people believe that jati is what happens at castle hospital. That's what they think what jati is. The child coming out of a mother's womb, that is jati. So therefore, of course, when a child is born, the child ages and the child decays and the child dies. So now we have a story to tell. None of that is true. It's only a projection of the mind because the mind doesn't understand what manifestations are. So let's try and figure that out. Why am I trying to share this with you? So I never have to see a tear in your eyes again. I tell you, you know, I'm, none of this is to offend you. I'll say things from here and you know, once in a while, none of it is to you. I know you have all been parents to me and you have cried enough on my behalf alone, let alone other children. Enough. Enough. Enough is enough. Just think about the last funeral you had in your family, the last death. Hmm? Maybe it caught you by surprise. Maybe it was something you were waiting to happen and it happened. Maybe someone died of cancer. Maybe someone just had a, you know, a sudden fall. Maybe someone had a stroke, a heart attack, died. Right? There's always someone in the family that's died, right? Like Patachara or Kisa Gotami, who was asked to go and bring some mustards from a house that no one had died. If I asked you to do the same, can you? Bring some mustards from a house that no one's died? Of course not. So someone's died and you've lived long enough, haven't you? All of you, you've lived long enough to, have, to see someone die. And if that was someone close to you, how did that make you feel? Just, you know, go back down, just, just remember, just reminisce how that made you feel. What were the feelings that flushed through your mind? Were you able to smile as genuinely as you do now back then? Was that a full smile? Or was it just a smile that you had to put on because you know you had visitors? So people came to see and pay their last respects, so you had to greet them. But of course you suffered. If it was your father, if it was your husband, if it was your wife, if it was your, if it was your uncle, your brother. Just think about how that made you feel. Is it not enough already? You're human for heaven's sake, ladies and gentlemen. You don't deserve to cry. You're human. A mother dog cries when its, when its puppy dies. Fine, it's only a beast. It's not human. 
It can't take on new views. It can't take on drushti. It can't take the Buddha Dhamma. But you, you can. You people don't deserve to cry. You're human. But no amount of watching any blockbuster movies is going to help you free yourself from that. Not eating at the biggest restaurant is going to help you free for fear yourself from that. Not flying the world around is going to help you free yourself from that. Flying around in a private jet or driving around in a chauffeur driven car is not going to help you free yourself from that. Only the Buddha Dhamma can help you free yourself from that. For that you need to understand that all there are are manifestations. This is what Anicca is all about. So let's try and understand what Anicca means. The first thing I want you to do, when I say the word Anicca, you're probably already thinking about something you already know. As I always ask you, leave it outside, don't bring it here. It will be there ready for you to take when you leave this hall. Don't worry, we've told the janitors not to clean that. Any drushti or any understanding of the Dhamma you already have, please leave it outside for the duration of, your, of the sermon we are here. Because I can't teach you something you already know. That's the problem. Teachers will agree with me. Any teachers in the room, you will agree with me. You can't teach a child something they already know. It's like if you know how to be happy, I can't teach you how to be happy. So when you think that you, pleasure makes you happy, I can't teach you unconditional happiness. So you need to set all those preconceptions to a side just for a moment. So when I, when I say the word anicca, a word will already come into your mind. That is anitya. And you'll think to yourself, of course, Swami Nansa, impermanence. Ring a bell? Impermanence? That is what Buddhism is about, isn't it? All things are impermanent. I just have one question to ask you. Do you need the Buddha to teach you that? Ask a Muslim, ask a Christian, ask a Hindu, ask an atheist, ask a non-believer, ask a scientist, ask anyone for that matter, ask them, do you think all things in this world, things in this world are permanent? Who in their right mind would say, yes, things in this world are permanent? Name one thing in this world that's permanent. Forget all the Buddhism that you've ever learned and still answer this question. Name one thing in this world that is permanent. That is nothing. So do I need to teach you that? I mean, is the Pope Catholic? Do I need to teach you this? All things are impermanent, yes. Like, duh. You don't need the Buddha having spent all that time under a Bodhi tree, reflecting on the Dhamma, fulfilling all the Paramita for all those yawns to come and tell us that the world is impermanent. I mean, if that is what he taught, let's not waste our time. I agree all things are impermanent. I'm not saying that they are not. Yes, all things are impermanent, but that is not the philosophy of the Buddha. And I'll prove that to you. I'll prove that to you that it is not the philosophy of the Buddha. Here's the deal. You always knew that things in this world are impermanent. Have you suffered any less? What is the acid test? of your understanding of the Dhamma. If you have understood the Buddha's teaching, you must suffer less, right? That is what the Buddha comes into this world for. To free all beings from suffering. So if, he, if, if his teaching is the teaching of impermanence, and you have already seen impermanence, even without listening to the Dhamma, must you not suffer less? 
But then people have this to say as a comeback. They tell us, yes, we know that things are permanent, impermanent, but we still haven't been able to internalize this understanding. I don't think so. I don't think there's anyone in this room that believes that anything in this world is permanent. And besides, then people will say impermanence leads to suffering. Anitya Dukkha. There comes the next one. Let's go to Anatma in a moment. If things are impermanent, they lead to suffering, people say. Can you say the same about a headache? Aren't you thankful that headaches are impermanent? <laughs> when you get a headache, what do you do? You go and somehow do something to get rid of it, right? And aren't you grateful when, you, when, when it goes away? So aren't you grateful that impermanence is, an, is, is a characteristic of all things? I don't deny. Impermanence is a characteristic of all things. All conditioned things are inherently impermanent. Yes. But impermanence or your understanding of impermanence is not going to make you suffer any less because that is not the reason you suffer. The reason you suffer is not because this world is impermanent. I'm sorry if I'm teaching you something or going against the, 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 the things, the Buddhism, the values or whatever, the understanding that you've held for the last 50 years of your life. You've always thought that Buddhism was about impermanence and today I'm telling you that it is not. Sorry if this is a bombshell. But I have to ask you the question. If it's not done it for you, then you've got to rethink. You know, this is the value of being human. Yesterday does not have to be today. Today does not have to be tomorrow. If what you've been doing until yesterday has led you to today and you're still suffering, you don't have to suffer tomorrow because you can change today. You can, you can reach out. So when I say anicca, I mean anicca. I don't mean anitya. Having said that, anitya or impermanence is also characteristic of all conditional things and I don't deny that. Let's get that straight first of all. I am not here to say that anitya or impermanence is not a characteristic of all entities. It is. All conditional things are inherently impermanent. Yes. There's no denying that. So the books aren't wrong. Every other book you will read will say that all things are impermanent. Yes, they are. They are. My point is, understanding that is not to help, going to help you rid yourself from suffering. That is my point. How do we know this? <laughs> well, look at us. <laughs> and besides, you don't need the Buddha to teach you impermanence. You have to admit that as well. Right? If I pick this and drop this on the floor, do you need Buddhism to tell me that this is going to break? Do you? No. Simple physics will teach you that. So if the Buddha's job in coming to this world was to teach us physics, then he is no better than Einstein. Why do we say he is the unequaled one? Why do we say he is the unparalleled one? then what claim can he make when he, when he realized under the Bodhi tree the Dhamma that he did and he said, in this world of Devas and Maras and Brahmas, none has ever understood or realized this until I did as a Samma Sambuddha. What right does he have to claim that then? If all he came into this world and said was something that we already knew. So then either the Buddha was wrong or we are wrong. Shall we take our pick? So then ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you about anicca. This is not about impermanence. Although, 
once you understand anicca, <clears throat> once you understand what I'm trying to give you by this word anicca, you will realize that impermanence is also a characteristic. It's all part of the package. So what is anicca then? There are several ways in which we can understand anicca. But we'll discuss one for today. And that is the concept of manifestations. When you say something's impermanent, you're talking about a fixed object. You're talking about an entity. Now you'll have a question, what do I mean by a fixed object? I can see several nods in the audience because you've been listening to these talks for a long time. But then I also see some blank faces because you've not heard me. We haven't discussed this before and that's okay. But be assured that these blank faces will one day turn into nods as well. So it's doable, it's possible. So thanks to the ambassadors in the room who are a reassuring source of, or a source of reassurement, reassurance for everyone. So what is Anicca? Let us try and get our heads around this idea of manifestation. We did touch on this subject a little while ago. Let me give you an example. Are you all familiar with Scrabble? The board game? Most of you are, okay. <clears throat> so it's a board game that I'm sure most of us enjoyed playing in our childhood where we take letters, they're printed on little tiles, and we form words out of them, don't we? I'm going to take two letters. I was meaning to bring a Scrabble board here today to show it to you, but then I realized it's going to be too small. You won't be able to see it from the back. So, instead, I'm just going to draw it on the board. What is this? It's a letter. O. Oh. What is this letter? N. Letter O and letter N. So what do you see on the board right now? Two letters. And the letters are O and N. What do you see now? O and N. What do you see now? O and N. What do you see now? You see O and N. That's it. What else do you see? Hmm? What else do you see? on. You see the word on. I'm trying to use some really simple examples so that everyone in this audience can understand. <clears throat> because there are professors here as well as six-year-olds. Try doing my role once in a while. <laughs> So I, 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 I try to use as simple examples as possible so that everyone understands. You know, Sunita and Sopaka also realized the Dhamma way before we did. And what did they knew or know about the world? Hardly anything at all. Buddhism is not complicated, ladies and gentlemen. They've made it so. How can the truth be complicated? Remember the other day I told you I have the best job in the world? I don't have to come and make up things. I just tell you the bare truth as it is. So everything I say is supported by itself. But if it's a lie, you need things on the, on the, on the surround, you need the things on the periphery to support it. Because a lie has to be supported by another lie. But the truth can stand upright on its own. So now you see the word on. Here's my question to you. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I want you to Think about the answers. You're free to share these answers with me as well. Okay. You see the word on. Yeah? What are we trying to learn here? 
what this idea of manifestation is. Okay? When I say the word on, it, it has some meaning to you, doesn't it? Like it is the opposite of off. So it has this word has a meaning to you. It's a word, a word that has meaning to you. Now when I say the word on, you have it has meaning. Tell me, that meaning, did it come from the O or did it come from the N? Where did that meaning come from? Did it come from the O or did it come from the N? The word on, did it come from O or did it come from N? And the meaning behind it, where did it come from? It came from nowhere. But it came nonetheless, right? See, this word on is a manifestation. O is a standalone letter. And just as much as N is a standalone letter. But when the two of them are brought together, something neither of them are doing individually happens. It's almost magical. <clears throat> Do you think the letter O knows that it's standing next to N? And they're forming a union, a bond. Do you think they have a pact that they form together so that they can both be together and go on, we are on? <laughs> Do you? Certainly not, right? So neither of these two elements know that they are part of the whole. Just like the cells in your body have no idea that they make you up. But you look at your cells and go, that's me. What right do you have to say that? When the cells disown you, what right do you have to own your cells? Anyway, that's an extension of this. We'll come back to that later. <clears throat> so did the O bring the N? Oh, sorry, did the O bring on? Did the N bring on? No, so did, when, the, when the letters O and N came together, did you see on running from somewhere and just, you know, just quickly come and jump into this? Did you? No. But you saw these two together and something manifested in your mind. That's a manifestation. These two elements These two elements individually are contributing but unbeknown to them. A manifestation is happening here. A part, you just said there were two letters. We place them just ever so closer to each other. You still said there were two letters. But we brought them closer and closer and closer together. At one point you said, ah, Swami so they are not just two letters. Now they are a word. Right, let me do something else. So O and N makes what? What does O and N make? Huh? On. Sure, yeah? Okay. So you say O and N makes what? They make on, eh? They make on? No? Ladies and gentlemen, this is not on. Make your minds up, please. Now what's on the board again? Huh? O and N. But you don't like to say it this way now. Now you want to say it, it's N and O. <laughs> but what do you actually see on the board? N and O. Hmm. Now? N and O. Now? N and O. But what about now? No. no. So what do O and N make? Is it on or is it no? Which one? Come on, make your minds up. I'll give you three seconds. And you can't change your mind again. I'll shoot you. <laughs> Which one? That's the deal with manifestations. 
that's the deal with manifestations your body looks human because it's configured in a certain manner three days ago it was a pot of rice don't you agree a week ago it was a loaf of bread hello you loaf of bread I mean, you are what you eat, right? But as you look at your body, you look at your, your fingers, your hands, your, you, know, you look at yourself in the mirror as you do this, huh? and you tell yourself, look, I'm dancing. Manifestation. The dance is also a manifestation. Because when causes line up in a particular order, in a particular fashion, in a particular style, in a particular sequence, and that sequence you determine, this is what we call convention. You know, there are absolute truths and there are conventional truths. You know the absolute truths. There's Rupa, Chitta, Chaitasika, and Nibbana. Don't worry about that. Just for, just, you know, just knowledge, general knowledge. If you didn't know that, ignore it. It's fine. You don't need it to. But here's what a conventional truth is. When absolute truths are configured in a certain way, we then identify them as conventional truths. But the problem is this, ladies and gentlemen. It's not wrong to, ha to bear in our minds conventional truths. But if we believe that these conventional truths are the absolute truths, that's where the problem is. If when you look at a conventional truth, a conventional arrangement, and you internalize an absolute arrangement or an absolute reality, now you're asking for trouble. That is why I say there is no such thing called death. Death is a conventional reality. It is not an absolutism. It's not an absolute concept. We only need conventional truths for our survival, for existence. Excuse me. Because, you know, if you want to call your friend, you want them to come, you know, you want, you know, there's Sam in the room. Sam, come over, mate. You'll ask him to come. Oh, John, please come around. Right, Nikki, come over, please. And you call them by their names. If you didn't have, if we didn't have conventional truths, how would you refer to them? Chitta Chaita Sikha Rupa Nibbana, come here. Chitta Chai Sikha Rupa, come here. You, know, you can't live in a world where we refer to things, you know, in the absolute terms. Right? I mean, that would be manic. It wouldn't make any sense. See, when the Buddha saw Visaka with her wet hair, having lost her grandchild, right, she was distraught. Although she was a Sotapanna by the point, Right? Yes, even a Sotapanna suffers because their understanding is one but they're, com they're, they're, they're still practicing the path. Right? They're not Arahants. So when the, when, when the Buddha saw Visaka, the, the Buddha said, Visaka, why are you here at this time you know, in this way? So he asked this question. Now, when the Buddha saw Visaka, he identified Visaka. He knows well and truly that all there is is Rupa, Chitta and Chaitasika. He knows this. But conventionally, we refer to them, he refers to it as Visaka. He refers to it as Ananda. He refers to it as Sariputta. He refers to him as myself. Plenty of times in the Tripitaka you will see how the Buddha talks about how great he is. All the while he knows he's not talking about himself. He knows he's talking about the greatness of a mind. He knows this, but he uses conventional terms because convention is what we need for convenience. But the absolute truth is another matter. So why are we talking about the absolute truth then? See, what do you have in the absolute truth? Chitta, Chaitasika, Rupa and Nibbana. Where is suffering? 
we're suffering. But then when we talk about conventional truths, mother, father, brother, sister, car, house, what happens to them? They break down, they decay, and they die. And then along comes with that what? Suffering. The reason you suffer, ladies and gentlemen, is because you live a conventional reality. Your minds conjure up a conventional reality and you live in it. That's why I love the metaphor of, of, of the matrix. You know, they've done a fantastic job there. Because we, today we can refer to it and if you, any of you have watched it, it's how your man is plugged into a machine, right? And when you're plugged into that machine, it creates this, this imaginary world and you live in it. But that is far from reality. So even if you haven't watched it, it's all right. You don't have to go home and watch it today. Swami Nase told us to go and watch Matrix. No, I didn't. I didn't. But think about this. These are, the absolute truths are, there is N and there is O. Here, there is N and there is O. What about this point? N and O. What about this point? N and O. Where is the no? Where is the no? No, that is your projection onto these absolute realities. You create a convention. You actually link these two together, don't you? Do you see a link between them? I mean, are these two things actually linked? Are they? They're not. Is that not why in Scrabble, you can lay down some tiles, right? So for instance, imagine if these were the tiles on a Scrabble board. <clears throat> right, those who know, can you tell me the scores for N? One, I think. One. And for O? One? One. Right. So someone's just played N and O and you've got, they've scored two. It's my turn to play. I see S and E on my rack. What am I going to do now? Here's what I'm going to do. So what happened to the no now? Where did no go? Oh. Bad example. Do <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Help me out, please. <laughs> Don't be evil. <laughs> this no, uh, this, this, this. When I played S and E, where did the no go? But you look at this now, you don't see no, do you? Do you see no? You don't see no, what do you see now? You see no's. So what happened to the no? It no longer manifests. What manifests now? N-O-S-E, no's. So now it's your turn to play. You look at that and go, hmm. If he can do one, I can do one better. I just added an S to the end of that. So where did the nose go? Where did the no go? These are all manifestations. Is it not because they are not fixed entities that we can change them in this manner. See, if no was a fixed entity, a fixed entity, now here I want you to try and get your head around what I mean by fixed. Something that cannot be changed. Now immediately you'll start thinking impermanence, 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 so I, mean, I get it, I get it, I get it. No, 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 not impermanence. I told you, leave it outside. I'm not talking about impermanence because impermanence, yes, but that's not the deal. Impermanence, yes, of course. This is all impermanent. Right? But we'll be missing the point if we keep focusing on impermanence. That's why I say, just leave that to a side. I'm not talking to you about impermanence. I'm talking to you about manifestation. Impermanence, if that is anitya, I'm talking about anicca. I'm talking about manifestation. 
Look at this. If you say something's impermanent and leave it at that, what you're saying is, no is impermanent. Nose is impermanent. And then you say, noses are impermanent. But where was the no to begin with? Where did it come from? And the moment I put the letter S and E here, where did the no go? Because if it came from somewhere, it must go somewhere, right? It's like when you light a fire. We talked about this example the other day. Can you imagine what discovering fire must have been like? It must have been mind-boggling. You know, someone just rubbing two splinters together and there's some dry hay somewhere and all of a sudden, there's a fire. You know what people would have done back then? Where did that come from? <laughs> Don't you think so? Because when you have something that, is com that, that does not resemble at all any of the parts that went into making it, then people will begin to wonder where it came from. That's why they looked up and said, thank you, God. And so there was a fire God. See, the God, God is the all-knowing one. When you don't have answers, there has to be someone who has all the answers. So the all-knowing one up there. So you have the fire God. People there used to have the rain God. People didn't understand the world previously. <clears throat> you know, they didn't understand this, this rock solid planet that we live on, right? So they thought this was, this was God's creation. Atlas was carrying the world on its, on its shoulders, they thought. Standing on a turtle's back. That's what they thought. You know, Greek mythology, if any of you have done any studies in that. Because when people didn't understand how the world works, they came up with all sorts of stories. So lightning from God. But then, what did science do? It started exploring the causes. Using the scientific method, right? They started exploring the, the causes and they came up with the causes. They said, right, these are the causes that lead to these effects. And then, God's time was up. So now, you know, you're not going to find science, fire God in a science journal. They'll say, what madness. So whether there's a fire god or not, I don't know. That's not my, my point here. But what I'm saying is, in a science journal, what they'll say is, if you believe that it is God that gives you fire, then you need to go see a doctor. That's what science will tell you. I'm not necessarily saying that's what I'm telling you. Right? Because I don't want to offend anyone, that's why. <clears throat> I told you I'm not a monk. I'm a scientist in a rope. Next day you should invite them to the sermon. So where did the no go? Where did the no's come from? When you talk about manifestations, ladies and gentlemen, you can't talk about where it came from and where it went. Because if you're talking about something coming from somewhere or going somewhere, you're talking about fixed entities. Because it is fixed entities that come and go. Remember, when the, when the Brahmins of the time went up to the Buddha and asked the Buddha, Sir, this self, myself, where did I come from? Where am I going? These are the questions that they had. Did I come from my previous birth? Am I going to the next birth? And where did I come to the previous birth from? Was it from the Mahabrahma? See, people are looking for their origins, aren't they? If you spend any time with your ancestry tree, your family tree, your ancestry tree, you, you like to know where you come from because you like to think, you know, many, many, many millions of years ago, I was a dinosaur cell. <laughs> and then we evolved. I, that's, that's a topic for another matter, or uh, another days rather. You know, this concept of evolution. Do we, do we come from monkeys? We'll talk about that another day. Once you all become arahants, come and tell me. We'll talk about that. 
But as we talk about these things, I think these answers will begin to appear in your own mind. You won't need me to spell them out for you. So please don't come and ask me yet either. So Swami Nasa, yes, yes. Did we evolve? Because I have a thesis to write for my <laughs> degree. Did we actually evolve from monkeys? What, is, what did the Buddha teach about this? Let's not go there. Because there's a bigger fish to fry. So what if we evolve from monkeys or not, if you're still suffering like monkeys? Right? That's the bigger problem to solve. So manifestations, ladies and gentlemen. I wrote the letters N and O previously on the board, right? And I, but then I wrote them in the other order, in the, in the, in, you know, I just swapped them around. And then you said the word was on, and now you say the word was no. If I were playing Scrabble and I had those two letters in my hand, you know, pre pre depending on which way, in which order, which sequence I put them in, you keep changing your mind. That's on, that's no. That's on, that's no. You keep saying that. So if it's no, and I pull those letters apart, where does it go? At what point does it stop being no? So if it, did, if it doesn't stop being no, at what point did it become no? See, this is what we need to think about. Now, I hope, I hope you're beginning to understand what I mean by manifestation. This is what a manifestation is. The reason that I can give you these examples is because manifestation is what really happens. But, so then, so then why do we see the world as fixed entities? Because we don't understand the world as manifestations, you look at this and you think, this is a nose, right? Now let me tell you what's going to happen to a nose. So that's a nose. <clears throat> what's happening to your nose? It's decaying, isn't it? Why is your nose decaying? I mean, not your nose, but this nose. Why is this nose decaying? Because you see a fixed entity. In your mind, you read this as one unit. You don't see it as its individual parts. You see it as one unit. So because you see it as, see it as one unit, now you're talking about impermanence. See, it was one unit earlier, and now it's decaying. And eventually what's going to happen? It's going to decay and it's going to? What happened to the nose now? Nose died. The nose is dead. So where did it go? This is the question that those days people used to have. When I'm dead, where do I go? A lot of you might have questions about rebirth, reincarnation, right? When I die, where do I go? Do I go to the heavens? Do I go to the hells? Do I go to the Brahmas? Or do I just go into, you know, the universe? Where do I go? Pay attention to these talks. You will have the answers for yourselves. You won't need to come and ask me. The reason you still ask where you're going is because you think it was you who came. Because if you came, then you have to go. If you arrived, you must go. So you're asking, where am I going? You're asking where you're going because you think it was you who came. But it's a manifestation. If it's a manifestation, how do you ask where it came from? I can put S and E back on the board again. Now, did you see me? Now, you have this, you have conjured up the, the idea of a nose in your mind, right? But did I actually hide a nose somewhere and just, just put it back on the board here? Did I? Did I have a nose somewhere lying around that I just put back on the board? Certainly not. So why then do you look at this word and the idea, the concept, the notion of a nose comes into, into your mind now, previously, where it was no? You know, do you think of both at once? Like now, when you look at this, you see N-O-S-E. Do you think of no and nose at once? No, you don't. 
So that both of them manifest at the same time. You see? Because otherwise you'd be reading no-nos. That's not what you're reading right now. You're reading no's. So it's one manifestation at a time. That is what anicca is. In simple terms, what there is in this world, ladies and gentlemen, are not, are not fixed entities. What there are, are manifestations. When causes line up in the right order, you get a manifestation. What is the right order is a, worth, is a question that is worth asking. Look at this for a second again. See, when we changed the order, it was a different manifestation, wasn't it? N and O in this order, you have no. N and O in the other order, you have on. So change the causes or change the order of the causes. Let me repeat that. Change the causes or change the order of the causes and now you have a different manifestation. I'll give you a proof that is very close to home. All three of you at home, or four of you, or five of you, you all eat from the same rice pot, don't you? So how come some of it can go into making you, some of it goes into making your father, some of it goes into making your mother, some of it goes into making your dog, some of it goes into making, I don't know, whatever else you have at home, or whoever else you have at home. It's the same rice pot. So how is it you all eat the same food, but different people exist at home? How is that so? Here's why. There's such a thing called DNA within your cells that determine the causes and their order. That is why you all manifest in different forms. And that is all you are. Just a manifestation of matter. So what is in rice? You have carbohydrates, you have proteins, right? you have minerals, you have vitamins, whatever. And if you break them down further, you have the elements. So the carbons, the hydrogens, the oxygens, the nitrogens, right? Whatever is, is, is constituent in that. The potassiums and all of them. So what are you then? Those elements configured in a particular order. But when you look at your hand, how do you feel? Do you feel that this is just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen configured in a certain order? Or do you actually feel that you're looking at your own hand? You have a sense of ownership, don't you? When you look at yourself? Don't you? You do. You get this sense of ownership. Where did that come from? Did it come from the rice? I'm not talking about the hand. The hand came from rice, yes. It came from what you ate. But where did the sense of ownership come from? Are you entitled to that sense of ownership, I ask you? I want you to think and answer carefully. Are you entitled to that sense of ownership if all you are are just the elements of nature configured in a certain way? What right do you have to call yourself you? What right do you have to look at your hand, your fingers and say, this is my finger? Tell me. But what happens if you break your finger? Ignore the pain, the physical pain. Ignore the physical pain. If you break a finger, if you twist an arm, right? If you lose a part of your body, or let's say you know you, your, your complexion starts to change all of a sudden. You know, some skin condition comes and if you're fair, you start going dark. If you're dark, you start going fair. And if you don't like that, now how are you going to feel about it? Suffering. See? Why suffering? Because of your sense of entitlement. But it's not in the rice. It's not in the matter. It's not in the elements. It's not in the constituents that made you in the first place. So there's something else going on in your mind that creates suffering when normal, regular, routine incidents happen in the outside world. 
you are simply, you know, this mass that you carry around with you, ladies and gentlemen, is simply matter in a particular arrangement. That's all it is. That's why when you die and your remains go into the soil, in three years' time, you'll have an apple tree. So if someone plucks an apple and eats that apple, are they eating you? People feel that way though. My grandfather was cremated here. And that apple tree that has grown there, we don't eat apples from that tree. Why? Because that is my grandfather. I mean, I've heard of grandfather's clocks. But this is on another whole new level. Grandfather's apples. But people feel this way. But where was the grandfather? Was the grandfather a grandfather to begin with? I ask you. Or was grandfather merely a configuration of matter? See, grandfather ate an apple, that apple went to making the grandfather, he died, and where he is dead, an apple seed was sowed, and now there's an apple tree, and now you have the apple fruit. At which point did it become grandfather? At which point did it become apple? So is the grandfather apple or is the apple grandfather? You have these questions because you think in fixed entities. That's why. That is why you have these questions in your mind. Ah, wait, Swami Nasa, so is that my grandfather? Or is the apple the grandfather, the apple the grandfather, the apple? Which one became which? Is the question you have. Which became which is the wrong question to be asking. When the Buddha was asked, Venerable Sir, when I am dead, do I become a Deva? I was a Deva in the past. I was a monkey in the past. I was a giraffe, I was an elephant, I was a rodent in the past and today I am a human being. Was it, was it that beast that has become human today and is it this human that goes on to become a deva tomorrow? And the Buddha said what? You are asking the wrong question. Because when people ask this question, they think in terms of fixed entities. It's a bit like you asking me, is it the no that became the nose? Oh, is it the nose that became the no? <laughs> See, I can simply do this. I have an O and I have an N. What is this? On. I'm going to take the N and I'm going to put it here. What is this? No, you tell me. What Swami Nwansi did was he changed, he changed, what's the word? He changed the no to an on. There is no such thing called change. I think we're going to have to go back to elementary school now, aren't we? <laughs> Everything we held was as true in this world. Swami Nwazi seems to be shredding it all into pieces. Because we thought change was the only constant. And now he tells us that no, there is no such thing called change. Change is a conventional reality. It's a conventional truth. You talk about change, ladies and gentlemen, because you're talking about fixed entities. One changes to another because you're talking about one state, another state. This changes to that. But there is no this and that. All there are, are manifestations. There is no this to become a that. There is no that that came from this. All there are, are manifestations. I don't expect the penny to drop immediately for everyone. You know, everyone will take their own time and that's perfectly fine. I took my time. I took my merry time. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. Your merits will help you understand this and your continued you know, being with these sermons will help you understand this. I don't expect this to make sense to everyone the same way and also not on the first time anyway. Perhaps some of you will go home today and say, I don't know what Swami Nwansi was talking about. All morning he took these two words and he said, on and no and on and no, I don't know. 
I'm not going back there again. <laughs> I was fine before I went there. <laughs> but I tell you this folks, if you understand this, you will not cry again. I want that for you. I tell you, I only come here with one purpose. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta. All humans, all beings deserve happiness. Each and every one, both friend and foe. I don't have friends and I don't have foes today because they're both fixed entities. A friend is a friend, a foe is a foe. If the mind projects that onto them, all there are are manifestations, conditions that lead to results in the present moment. You know, you'll have heard, of course, where people talk about living in the moment, that in the present moment, most people have misunderstood this concept. They think living in the moment entails, in Buddhist philosophy, you know, there may be other beliefs, other faiths, other teachings which talk about living in the moment and whatever progress you can make in those ways. I have no qualms about any of that. But in Buddhist philosophy, when we talk about living in the moment, it's not merely about just being aware of what you're doing right now. Because couldn't you be doing a bad thing right now and just be aware that you're doing a bad thing? How is that going to help you at any burn? A sniper with a sniper gun in his hand aims at his target and thinks about nothing else than his target. He's preparing to shoot the fellow dead. If you're telling me that is mindful awareness, I mean, come on. That can't be mindful awareness. That might be mindfulness. Just being mindful, the mind is full. That's what mindful is. The mind is full with whatever it is you're thinking about right now. So you could be eating, you could be uh, washing, you could be walking, you could be driving, you could be, you know, just thinking about what you're doing right now. That will help you to focus your mind on one thing. But Buddhist philosophy is not about focusing your mind on one thing. It's about cleansing your mind. Cleansing your mind and focusing your mind on one thing are not the same things. They are very different things. They are worlds apart. Have you seen a cat just lurking around looking for a rat? Yeah. And when it spots one, what does it do? It stops, it freezes. Hmm? Just, it's, it's, it's mindful. It's mindful about the rat because it doesn't want to make any sudden movements in case the, 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 the rat gets, gets wind of the, the fact that the cat is here. So it's targeting its prey, it wants to catch its prey. Don't you think the cat is mindful? I mean, if the cat can also be mindful, I ask you, what did the Buddha give us? So mindfulness is not about just being, just thinking about what you're doing right now. It's, think, it's asking a very more, a much more important question. Do I feel that it is I who's doing it? Aware of the process of seeing. If you are aware of how seeing happens, that is mindful awareness. So as you see something, you ask yourself, how is it that seeing happens? There's an object, there's the eye, the eye and the object come into contact, there's eye consciousness that is born, arises and passes away. But I sense that it is I who's seeing, the sense of self. And if you feel that it is you who's seeing, now you have to ask the question, which, where did it come from? Did it come from the object? Did it come from the sight? Where did the eye come from? That is a creation of the mind because of jati. I'm jumping a little bit here and there. It's fine, right? Don't worry. If some of this doesn't make sense to you, right? I'm not strictly following like, you know, a syllabus. I'm just jumping here and there a little bit, but they'll all make sense eventually. Just hang in there. I promise you. If you want to free yourself from suffering, just bring yourself here and I'll do the rest. There's one more thing you have to do. 
engage in as many merits as you possibly can. Because Vipaka has a large part to play. This is not pure determinism. Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy is not about pure determinism. The environment is required to draw the Vipaka. But if you don't have the Vipaka, there is no environment I can create to help draw those Vipakas. We create the environment here, ladies and gentlemen, for your good Vipaka, your meritable Vipaka to be drawn. If you, for instance, go to the tavern, that is also an environment. If you hang around with the bad kind of people, chances are, if they do something bad, you're also going to get in trouble, right? Aren't you? If, you? if you hang around a bunch of robbers, a bunch of thieves, a bunch of burglars, when they get caught, you're probably also going to get locked up, at least for a day, until they question you, and then you say, no, I was, I, I'm innocent, I, I didn't do anything. But if you're in the, in, the, in the scene of the crime, you'll probably get locked up as well. See, the environment will always draw the, that kind of vipaka. But when you're here, now you're meritable vipaka. All the meritorious deeds that you have done, we have created the environment for those vipakas to be drawn. Answer this question for me. I have a mango seed in my hand. Let's keep staring at it and expect a mango. How long should we keep staring at it? Does it not have the potential to create a mango? Does it not? It does. So then tell me, how long should I keep staring at it until I get a mango? Why not? What have I not created? The environment. The moment I create the environment, now it begins to do its job. See, Vipaka is always there, both good and bad. But you as human beings, all of us, we have the potential, we have the ability to draw the right kind of vipaka by our associations. If you associate with the right people, you will draw the good kind of vipaka. If you associate the right, bad kind of people, you will draw the, right, bad, the bad kind of vipaka. That is why oftentimes I'll tell you, your associations are so important. That's why noble association takes you to Nibbana. An ignoble association keeps you in sansara. So it's not deterministic. It's not fate. It's cause and effect. This is Hetupalavada. Not Akriyavada or any other kind of Vada. This is Hetupalavada. The principle of cause and effect. All things are driven by the principle of cause and effect. This is the Buddha's teaching. So does this make sense to you? Please don't say no. <laughs> I just wanted to get the point across about manifestation. We talked about this a few weeks ago, but I, was, I wanted to give you a few more examples and also the connection between manifestations as well as his karma and vipaka and how you are not helpless right just because you might have done something bad right maybe you've done some bad karma in your past in your past births maybe some bad karmas in your in this birth in your past maybe they come back to haunt you from time to time ladies and gentlemen fear not don't worry about it because we have the buddha <laughs> I tell you, the Buddha is the greatest con man. <laughs> Why so? Because he discovered the way, despite having done all those terrible deeds, right? whenever in sansara, you can always get an, find an escape by doing what you choose to do right now. I love him for that. This is the best discovery. It's like we've thrown something up in the air, but before it, before it comes back down and hits us on our head, we can move. We are not trees, are we? We are not rocks and mountains. So that whatever has been thrown up has to come back and drop on our heads. We can move. We can do things. We can change our course in life. And the drushti will help you do that. That is what you get from here. And in any sermon or any talk or any association that you have, people will give you drushti. If someone tells you, you know, watch as much TV as you like, right? then you will sit in front of the TV and you will just watch TV. That will bring you all sorts of vipaka, like failing your exams, then not getting anywhere with your life. Right? But 
if you put yourself in the right place, right? Do your homework, do your work, right? Do your math, do your do your problems, do your uh, school work, and attend the classes, right? Take the lectures. Then that will also drive you another path. It's like a train. There are various tracks you can go on. Depending on which track you choose, you will end up in a different destination. But both tracks exist. That's the deal. That is why we as humans born into the Sugati can choose what's going to happen to us. Whereas in the Dugati, animals don't get to choose. Animals don't get to choose. It seems like they sometimes make choices, but naturally they're just acting out of habit. Or they practice. That, you know, like sometimes in the zoo or you know, at, the, at the circus, you see animals doing all sorts of performing tricks. Hey, that's because they've been trained to do that. But you know, so you don't need to be trained to do much, many, many things at all. If I ask you to put your right arm up, you can do. Your, you can put your right arm. You don't have to practice it a hundred times. But an elephant, a horse, a, 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 a dog, you got to practice the thing, right? You got to train it to put its arm up. It doesn't. It doesn't understand. So out of behavior, you got to train it. until it becomes a habit. So, if you understood the concept of manifestation, now here's what I want you to do then. Over the next week, I try, I like to leave you with a bit of homework every week if you can, if you find the time to do it, because then, here, here's why I give you some homework. Not because I've got nothing better to do and I know you have other things to do as well, but I give you a bit of homework because ladies and gentlemen, over the next week, if you can at least think about this and contemplate this, you will have a few moments to reflect on this truth so that when you come back the following week, we can continue from there. And it's the application of the truth that will set you free. People say knowledge is power. I don't believe in that. Knowledge put into action is power. You know the Tripitaka, the 57 books of it, or 52, I can't remember now. The 50 something books of the Tripitaka, they're all typeset, aren't they? Someone's typeset them, someone's printed them, someone's bound the books together, someone's packed them, wrapped them, boxed them, put them on the shelves. Do you think everyone who's involved in typing it, typesetting it, page setting it, they all have attained Nibbana? So the Dhamma and Nibbana are very different things. Learning the Dhamma, reading the Dhamma is not the same as attaining Nibbana. If so, then everyone who's been involved in typing, reading, proofreading, bound, binding, packing, whatever the Tripitaka must have attained Nibbana by now. That's not so. Because in the Tripitaka you have the Dhamma, but not the practice. It is your practice that will take you from where you are today to where you want to be. And that practice you have to do as much as possible. I have chosen the life of a monk because I can practice what I preach and what has been preached to me all the time because no one comes and invites me to a party. But living the life that you do, you will receive invitations from time to time and then you will have to say okay. If not, you will stand out you know, like a sore thumb. And people think you're weird. You can't do that. Living a lay life, you have to conform to the lay lifestyle. So you, you, mustn't, you mustn't opt yourself out of all of those things because then it will become very uncomfortable. It will become you know, almost hell. Life will become very difficult for you. That's why the two things you can choose to do. One, stop listening to the Dhamma. <laughs> or choose this lifestyle. Or thirdly, live the life that you live. Be among them, but don't be one of them. What your arms and legs and your body does has nothing to do with Nibbana. As you dance, so tomorrow, you know, if there's a wedding, go. It's fine. So I mean, has not come to, you know, come and tell you off for it. If someone comes and tells, you know, so I that lady who comes to the Sunday sermons, I saw her in the wedding that day. She was dancing. I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, I won't say anything about it. Because of course, when you're at the party, what must you do? You must dance. You must. 
And if they ask you to come on stage and sing a song, sing. What's the problem? Sing. If you have to, you know, have a chit chat with your friends, do so. It's fine. That is your outwardly expression to others. Nibbana is a purely internal thing. So while you're doing your Nibbana, do what pleases others on the outside. You know, it's like when, you were, when your kids were much younger, you know, they were just little kids. They brought you their drawings, didn't they? And then you appreciated them for their drawings when you, you, know, you couldn't even make head or tail of what they'd drawn. You said, oh, nice, Buddha, how lovely. What is it you have drawn? <laughs> and then they tell you what they've drawn. Of course, it's that. How could Ami not know? What a fool I was. And then you keep appreciating the, the little thing, you know, because that is what they expect from you. So you, as long as you give people what they expect, they have no qualms. They have no complaints. So don't come running to me saying, Swami Nohan sir, everyone's complaining now, people don't like me anymore, my friends, they've all left me, my family's left me, my wife has left me, my husband's left me, right? Don't come complaining about that. Because if you do so, you're not doing what I'm asking you to do. You're going against my advice. If you consider that you are getting good instruction here to help you with Nibbana, then kindly do as I ask you to do. Don't make life difficult for you, for yourselves. When you're among your friends, be among them. Be among them. If your family is sitting down to watch television, sit down with them and watch television. But as you watch television, as you see people doing this, that and the other, contemplate. And then someone will ask you, nice dance, isn't it? You go, yes, wonderful dance. You know, words don't hurt. Just, just you know, how much does it cost to just give you a kind, you know, that be kind to them. This is about being kind. Be gentle to them. Out of compassion, do it. Because if you don't, here's what will happen. One, they'll stop you from coming to the sermons. That's the first thing that's going to happen. Those days, you used to be a fun guy to hang around with. Now you start listening to the sermons, you are not going to the sermons again, please. Right? Because now you're weird. Right? They'll lock you up, they'll, detain, they'll give you detention. No more Sunday outings. Either that is going to happen, or here's something worse that will happen. They will start making offensive remarks towards the Dhamma, the Buddha, and the Sangha. They will say, this wretched Buddha, hmm? this nuisance, nonsense Dhamma, this good-for-nothing Sangha, they are the ones who ruined my husband. He was a fine man until then. We had a loving life together, wonderful life together, and then he started listening to this, this bold-headed And then ever since he started doing that, I, all happiness in our lives have been drained. Then they start telling off the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, the noble triple gem. And once they start doing that, there is no hope for them. This is what they call Aryupada. So, out of compassion towards them, please don't lead them down that rabbit hole. It will take them a very long time to come back out of it. Sometimes maybe eons. So the safest thing you can do is when you are with your friends, be with your friends. When you are with your family, be with your family. When you are among your colleagues, you know, if you have a Friday night get together right at the workplace, then go. If I was still a layman, I know I'd still go to the club, to the pub, wherever. If you don't want to take an intoxicating drink, you know, take a Pepsi. Or just take a glass of water and say, you know, today I'm alright for today. <laughs> but, you know, talk with them, have fun with them, you know, joke with them. And if when they make a joke, don't just say, that's a manifestation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you can laugh at my dry jokes, <laughs> huh? why can't you laugh at their jokes? Don't be holy there. Oh, be holy here, it's fine. Right? But when you're there, be among them. Honestly, folks, I'm giving you personal advice from my personal life. Okay? Because my teacher gave me careful advice and instructions that I followed to the letter. Which is why today I have been able to enjoy this life without as much as a, you know, 
any 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 regrets or any heartbreaks or hardship right i was able to manage and navigate myself along this path carefully so i share with you the same advice and guidance out of compassion for all of you please do it if you love them your family right of course you do out of compassion for them don't be the holy one at home so you know if you never done meditation at home and people don't like you doing that don't go sit yourself down under the buddha statue and start meditating you don't you know don't do that if that is not the thing that is done at home if if they are okay with it then that's fine but always check the temperature always check it right first dip your toe in the water before you get in right if you want to do some meditation at home see if your wife is okay with it if she says what's all this nonsense what is this meditation 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 every day breakfast lunch and dinner or is it no you don't eat now you don't sleep now you don't talk with me you don't watch tv all you do is meditation mark my words your meditation days will be over very soon <laughs> so don't do that honestly you know if you follow my advice your journey to nibbana will be an easy one but if you try to overdo it people will not like it remember the world out there belongs to the mara you are slowly becoming disciples of the buddha the buddha dhamma and the mara dhamma are at odds with each other The Mara Dhamma teaches you how to grasp the world as much as possible and to get the biggest and the greatest and the the the, the, the most delicious part of it and to consume it and to be consumed by it. That is what the Mara Dhamma does. Whereas the Buddha Dhamma helps you to free yourself from the world. See, these two things must be at odds, mustn't they? One deals with the world; the other deals with getting out of this world. So only be a Buddha disciple while you are here physically. Mentally, be it everywhere. So people should not be able to look at you and say, "You are going to Rajagiri sermons, aren't you?" But it's okay if they start saying nice things about you. Then it's okay. You are much nicer than you used to be. You are very well spoken now. Right? Very soft spoken. You used to be shouting at me, yelling at me, screaming at me. But remember. the very person that tells you that you are nice to them kind to them gentle to them right just keep it at the optimum level <laughs> if you become too nice to them now again they will start having complaints about that you know there are families where the other half enjoys it from time to time when they get beaten up <laughs> forgive me for saying this but this is the truth right it keeps it keeps it exciting for them <laughs> so if all that stops you know i mean i know you don't want to hit anyone or beat anyone but you know just at least from once in a while if you if that is the done thing that you know <laughs> <laughs> these things you make me say right enough of this <laughs> so please you know for your own sake right well now that we've started this journey let's finish this hmm you started this journey let's how many times have you started this journey before How many new sermons have you start, have you have you managed to get to in your life? Like one in Kochika Day, one in Apanadura, one in other some Abhegiriya, one in Anuradhapura. Right? You've been doing this like all your life. How many YouTube channels have you started watching in the hope that you know one of them will lead you to realization and nibbana? <laughs> Too many cooks will only spoil the broth. This is another piece of advice I can give you. If you want to cook your broth have one cook because the deal is each cook will have a different recipe one at salt at the beginning the other at salt at the end so if you start with one cook at the beginning they at tell you to add salt then you leave that cook halfway through and you go to the other cook and now he says add salt <laughs> because you only joined him at the end can you eat your eat your broth no because it is too salty but the cooks individually they are right they are all right all the cooks are right but they each have their own recipes but you have to follow one recipe right from start to end it doesn't have to be here wherever it is 
I mean, if you if you are following another Bhantes or another Swami Nuhantes or another even Gihimahatyas, right, sermons and practicing that as your path to Nibbana, I suggest you do that because this will be a different recipe. They're both right. They're both right for them and if you follow that path, it'll lead you to, you know, that ultimate goal. But if you have too many teachers, as with anything, too many cooks spoil the broth. Right, let's conclude for today then. And please, once again, I don't mean to offend anyone with anything I say. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Please, please, I beg you. Right? Please don't feel I, I, I mean to offend anyone. I'll say, you know, I'll say things from time to time because I feel I can talk to you now, you know, very freely. I, you know, I see regular faces, you know, I think we've become friends in that way. I think we know enough, each, uh, enough of each other that we, I don't have to keep apologizing to you for anything I say because it is not meant to offend you. As all I say, I do this, that and the other, it's not meant to offend you. There might be a dancer here, I don't know. I mean, maybe someone's a professional dancer. And I say, you know, have you seen yourself, how silly you look when you dance? It's not meant to offend you. I just want you to get the most out of your human life. That's all. Because you were not born to dance. You were born to free yourself from suffering. Today you think dancing will lead you there, but not so. Michael Jackson died crying. And he was a dancer all his life. Let's conclude. Let us all take a moment then to transfer the merits that we have all acquired by making offerings to the infinite virtues of the noble triple gem inviting the Swami Nuhansis to deliver the sermon, as well as bringing yourselves here, inviting others to come along, preparing the, the venue and making it comfortable for others to join in, as well as the decorations that you have made on behalf uh, of the Buddha Sasana as an offering to the Buddha Sasana. Let us transfer all these merits that we have all acquired to all those who deserve it. First and foremost, let us remind ourselves how, in, how grateful we are and how indebted we are to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasikas and upasikas who have since time immemorial protected and preserved the sublime teachings of the Buddha and passed it down through the generations of the noble lineage which is available today in the form of the Sripitaka to study, understand and comprehend the Dhamma. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to the, to the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who have always been by your side through thick and thin come rain or shine. Let us also transfer these merits to all members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all of the chapters who have dedicated their lives to the noble path as well as committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us also transfer these merits to my teacher, Guru Swami Nuhansi, as well as all the monks resident at the monastery and the Anagarika and Anagarika communities attached to the monastery. May they all rejoice in these merits and by... Let us also transfer these merits to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transliterating these talks, sharing them out with others or inviting others to join them. By the power of these merits, if, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits. To our devotees and friends of the monastery, who for the sake of merits to help them attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana, contribute towards the construction of the monastery, as well as those who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes and medicines, as well as those who continue to extend their will wishes and their know-how, may they all rejoice in these merits, and by the power of these merits may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these maids to our mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our friends, our acquaintances, our employees, our employers, our teachers, and those who have helped us, supported us, and assisted us in any way, shape, or form. May they all rejoice in these merits. By the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, may they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to the devas and brahmas, spirits and demons, and primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who have committed themselves towards the betterment 
and fulfillment and preservation of the Samudha Sasana. Let us take a moment to transfer these merits to, the, to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way by the power of these merits. May they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits. All the merits we have acquired to those who have predeceased us, our ancestors, our forefathers, those who have passed away in our name. It is in their blood, sweat, and tears today we enjoy the comforts that we do, as well as have the environment to practice the path and free ourselves from suffering once and for all. May they all rejoice in the merits that we have acquired. Let us also transfer these merits to those who make great sacrifices on behalf of our nation to protect the peace and harmony of our country. This includes the armed forces as well as the police force. Let us also transfer these merits to those who have lost their lives in the wars, be they friend or foe. Let us also transfer these merits to those who have lost their lives in natural disasters such as the tsunamis and earthquakes landslides, fires, pandemics, and so on, reminding ourselves that in this infinitely long journey of sansara, they will all have been mothers and fathers to us, brothers and sisters to us, friends and acquaintances to us. Let us take this moment to be grateful to all that they have done on our behalf and transfer these merits to all of them by the power of these merits. If any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may you and I, and everyone who's helped make this program a success, become an Arahatun Mahansi in this very life itself, and may this blessed land be blessed with many Arahatun Mahansis or Arahat Terenin Mahansis in this era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. Members of the Mahasangha will now transfer their blessings to you. <coughs> Sukhayen Sukita Tara Vetma Mamad Sia Luloka Sia Lu Satnayo Nibbana Parma Sukhayen Sukita Tara Vetma Nibbana Parma Sukhayen Sukita Tara Vetma Nibbana Parma Sukhayen Sukita Tara Vetma Raga Gini Niveva Desha Gini Niveva Moha Gini Niveva Nivan Sapalabeva Nivan Sapalabeva Nivan Sapalabeva Sundurange Suisi Ananta Mahaguna Belen Silu Loka Silu Satyoma Nibbana Paramasukhen Sukhita Taravetva Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu